Uh, now we're going to hear from Rick Dalton. Hello, good morning. Um, just to orient me, I'm, I'm curious how many of you are actually undergraduates at this conference? So it's like a very minority of undergraduates here. And how many are graduate students? Okay, so this is really different than in the United States where SSDP is mostly um, undergraduates. So it's good to see that there's a, a broader age spectrum that you've got here. Um, I particularly like the topic of this, the title of the conference, um, Blueprint for Beyond Prohibition. And I think thinking about the world that we want to create instead of constantly complaining about the world that we have is a really good way to try to you know, build towards the future. So what I'm going to try to talk about is you know, how do we get to a post-prohibition world? And what's the role of drugs and healing in that transition? And I think even to you know, speculate about post-prohibition world, things change in a very, very slow manner, or so it seems for a long time. Then there can be these you know, bursts of rapid change. But since we ended, in the United States at least, ended alcohol prohibition about uh, 75 years ago or something, we've been stuck in this um, provision of other substances. And it's had just enormous uh, negative consequences, and yet it still is not over. And it's hard for us to actually predict when it's going to be over. And at least from what I understand, there's a backlash going on in Canada that's slowing down the process to a post-prohibition world. And in the United States, there's been some really good moves that President Obama has made, but there's also a certain number of compromises that he's making or decisions that he's been delaying. And there's also been some backlash in the Netherlands even, sort of clamping down on the coffee houses. So while we want to think that this is a horrible policy and there's an inevitability about the transition to a post-prohibition world, it could really take a long time from where we are. Um, I'm on the board of Normal, and it's in, which is a national organization for the reform of marijuana laws in the United States. And it's incredibly humbling to be with um, Keith Straub, who started it in 1971 with the conviction that in the next four or five years, marijuana prohibition would be over. So he is now retired as the, the director. He's transferred to uh, the reins now in St. Pierre. And you know, to have this perspective that you can have all of these hopes and it can seem inevitable, and yet, it just still hasn't happened. It causes us to really try to refine our strategies. And I think when you look at what really caused the, the hopes of those in that early group of reformers, it was the fears of parents about their children. It was the rise of the parents' movement in the late 70s and the way in which they were able to mobilize fears of other parents about drugs causing their kids to go off in wrong directions and then that was matched up with Ronald and Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign and the whole escalation of drugs as a national security threat. But really, it's the fears of sort of mainstream parents about their kids. And when you look at what actually ended alcohol prohibition and also what started it, it's mostly women and mothers. I mean, it was the Women's Christian Temperance Union that really helped generate the sort of moral outrage about the evils of alcohol. And then by the end of the 1920s, early 30s, there was just such crime associated with um, the prohibition of alcohol, such widespread disrespect for law, and such kind of glamorization of the gangsters, of Al Capone and all the money that they were making and their whole lifestyle, that there, and also the poor quality alcohol that often would cause blindness or could, you know, homemade alcohol, that the harms it caused from that, that mothers started being really more scared of the drug war and the prohibition than they were of the alcohol. And so the largest group that started in the late 20s and early 80s that actually ended prohibition was a group of women. And they were able to really um, mobilize again the sort of moral support about protection of their kids. So I think when we look at larger society, we're not at that place in this moving to a post-prohibition world. There are, when you think of parents groups that are involved with um, the drug war, they're almost always anti-drug. You know, the parents groups that you think of, they're the ones that say, we need harsher laws, we need to throw people in jail. And that's why, um, actually, in SSDP, one of their t-shirts, it's my absolute favorite SSDP t-shirt, 
was it has a picture of a, a guy talking to his parents, and it says, have you talked to your parents about drugs? Because <laughs> that, that's what we need, this sort of movement up. So where does drugs and healing come in? And I think that drugs and healing is a way to try to communicate to parents, to society, that the enormous amount of misinformation that, that's been promoted to generate fear about drugs, that a lot of it is skewed, a lot of it is not balanced, and that these substances that are portrayed as, like MDMA for a long time was portrayed as one dose permanent brain damage. There, you know, there was on Oprah, I guess you get Oprah up here. <laughs> Oprah's like the, <laughs> you know, the classic, you know, if anybody's gonna be compassionate about, you know, people suffering, you know, she would cry on a dime and she would, <laughs> You know, and so Oprah actually had a show on MDMA that we were the consultants with for a while until they started ignoring all of our suggestions. And they, they showed an image of this young woman, a college student, who'd done all, this, um, all these drugs. And they, um, she had drug problems, and she went to this uh, clinic where conveniently her mother worked, and they didn't tell you that. Um, and she got a brain scan. And so the show was to, you know, showing this brain scan, and it was a brain scan filled with holes. Now, I, I don't have it on my computer, but I used to use it a lot for uh, my PowerPoint presentations, but it's the kind of a brain that if you looked at it, anybody that had medical training, the person would not be alive. The person would not be like walking and talking, you know, and so then they bring this young woman who's extremely articulate and seems to have survived unscathed from all of her use of ecstasy, and, and she says, yeah, that's my brain, you know, all this whole completely graphically manipulated image that had no basis in science. And so there's just this enormous, enormous fear that has been generated, capturing even Oprah. And now they're so embarrassed, actually, that we've contacted their staff multiple times about how they should correct it, and they refuse to even respond back to us. So maybe eventually she will. But drugs and healing are a way to, through science, science has such a respected place in our world, um, more so than religion. I mean, I'm all for religious use, but I'm not all for religions. <laughs> and I think that um, religions are really, um, you know, they, they have a lot of value. They're, they're, you could say the same about, you know, any kind of form of government, that there's inevitable corruption and, you know, it's just we're trying our best. So I think that there's, at least in our current society, there is more of a trust in science than in religion. You know, and science can become its own religion and dogmatic and not the, and deny spirituality. But when we want to say, how do we magnify what we're trying to do? How do we use what little leverage we have in a world where there's billions of dollars of anti-drug education? every year by Partnership for a Drug-Free America donated by all the networks. How, how is it that we try to present a different picture to the culture so that we can really start eroding all these enormous reservoirs of fear? And science and medicine is, I think, the best way to do it. I think that, as we see already, um, we've gotten really good at, at getting a large amounts of publicity for studies that we haven't even started. <laughs> Yeah, it takes a long time to start research, and so what we, we see is that the magnification through the media of new scientific findings is one of the very best ways to get free media to really challenge the kind of mindset that the culture has. Now, when we talk about drugs as medicines, what we're thinking about normally is pharmaceutical industry developing drugs into medicines for profit. And I think what we saw from Philippe's you know, non-profit model for the dispensary, for the VIX, that we have to recognize that the drugs that we're talking about, the drugs that we have to educate the society about, are abandoned by the pharmaceutical industry. There's even a program at FDA called Orphan Drugs, where they provide money to develop orphan drugs that have been abandoned by the pharmaceutical industry. But in that particular program, it's for drugs that affect 200,000 people or less per year. So they're abandoned because they're not going to make money. They're not abandoned because they're going to erode the profits of the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. So that we have to take a look at um, MDMA, LSD, um, marijuana, psilocybin, mescaline, psychedelics, and marijuana are 
off-patent, generic.